Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 617 for the 9th of August 2020. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia. How about that? The sun has come out. We were promised uh, buckets and puddles and poodles and all sorts of uh, rain events. It was a bit wet lately. Don't you just love hearing the weather conditions in Sydney, Australia? Coming up on this week's show, I talk to Sue Yurachi. Now, I first met Sue towards the end of last year when I was making promotional videos for Skepticon 2019, which was in Melbourne. Don't we all wish we could visit our friends in Melbourne at the moment. Anyway, I was very impressed by Sue's breadth and depth of knowledge in all things medical, especially, specifically, and uh, poignantly about uh, quackery. And I was very pleased to hear of her concerns about, uh, well, the anti-vaxxers in particular. Now, Sue is an Australian, as it says in Wikipedia, Sue is an Australian doctor and medical specialist with more than three decades experience in the public health system. She is a vocal advocate for improvements in emergency medicine and how it is viewed in the hospital work frame and patient-centered care. Now, Sue is a member of Friends of Science in Medicine, and uh, we've certainly spoken about that fine group here on the Skeptic Zone before. Find out more when I interview Sue Yurachi coming up at the top of the show. After that, it's Michelle Vickersma back again with Logical Fallacies. This time, Michelle's going to be looking at the appeal to consequences, to outcomes. What's going to happen? I think this is going to happen, therefore this. Something like that. After that, it's the strange case of uh, some new medication being tried out in a hospital, and uh, the patient has blue spots on his toes. Hmm. Find out a bit later on. Then to round off the show, we're going to be looking at, via um, some recent articles, the free man of the land, the sovereign citizens, or the sovsits, as they're known. These are the people, seems to me, primarily in their cars, being pulled over by police for speeding or, you know, little traffic infringements, and then going into this strange, bizarre... I'm a sovereign citizen, here's my paperwork, I've downloaded this from the internet, I'm not going to answer any of your questions. Um, they won't roll down their windows, which is a bit of a uh, an indication. They somehow feel that uh, the laws don't apply to them for uh, reasons that have just been more or less made up, shared around, believed by these people, and they just get themselves into no end of trouble. And why we're seeing it more and more at the moment is because these people are pulling these same stunts when it comes to, well, especially if we think about uh, the state of uh, things in um, Melbourne at the moment where people are required to wear face masks when they briefly leave their homes. So there are people complaining that they're sovereign citizens and they don't have to wear this mask and it's against this bit of the common law and on and on and on it goes. Poor police get quite exasperated. And uh, there, are, uh, if you're interested, there are many, many, many examples of that on YouTube where these people are filming the whole thing going on. Well, there's a police uh, video of interactions with these people and they're the people themselves filming from inside their cars as the police smash down their windows. It's quite dramatic. But that's enough for me at the moment. I'm going to run downstairs and you know what? These days, because it's winter here in Australia, as soon as I run downstairs in the early morning, which it is now, I bet I know what I'm going to find. I'm going to find a couple of cats either side of the radiator, toasting away, cozy cats, that's what I call them, on a cold winter's morning. Anyway, I'm going to tiptoe around the cozy cats because um, they're just going to mount me for breakfast or something. And uh, I think I'll just have some good old, simple... Uh, Vegemite toast. A little bit of cream cheese. A little bit of cream cheese on the toast. And uh, just a, a smearing of Vegemite. Sometimes I like quite a lot, but today just a light smearing of Vegemite. I'll give that a go with a nice coffee. 
While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Joining me now on the line, all the way from Sydney, Australia, it's Sue Yachi. Hello, Sue. Hey, Richard. How are you doing in these strange times? Well, I guess we're all doing as best as we possibly can. And I thought it was about time I gave you an interview because I first met you towards the end of last year. We might have we might have bumped into each other before. You That's gave, right. Yeah, you gave a wonderful talk at Skepticon 2019. Uh, late last year, or was it early this year? Everything seems like another world ago, doesn't Whenever it? Whenever it was in that um, time before. But it was in the time before. We used to live in a time before. Now, briefly, briefly, I, I, I did talk about you a little bit in, in the introduction, but you're really a medico from way back, aren't you? That's right. Um, I spent 35 years plus in the public hospital system before leaving a couple of years ago to take up telemedicine. That's an, an interesting thing, and we discussed it uh, late last year when we met. Can you expand on this whole idea of telemedicine, please? Yes, and it's um, very fortuitous that the, the business that I work for actually started as several years before this pandemic time as a way of bringing better access to healthcare advice and treatment to the community. And the business that I work for is actually, seems paradoxical, it's emergency telemedicine. And it's a way for people who have urgent concerns or symptoms to contact an emergency specialist directly and either get advice or reassurance or perhaps get a prescription or be directed to the right health service, depending on what their likely diagnosis is. So this is a, a service that's really flourished during the time of pandemic because it meets needs that we didn't even realise were coming. Absolutely. And, and it, it, I guess it's, it's always been a vital need, emergency medicine, but to, to think you can do it over the phone or indeed over video conferencing? Yes, that's right. Sometimes it's only audio and sometimes it's also video. But I guess anyone listening to your podcast will understand that you can actually interpret a lot from a person's voice, from um, the way wow. they speak, whether they're breathless, whether their speech makes sense or if they're confused and whether they're distressed or if they sound cheerful and happy. Um, the more yeah. you think about it, the more you understand that when you're talking to somebody, you can interpret a lot over the phone. But obviously video adds something more and now that we have so many technologies on in everybody's pocket, it's um, really useful to be able to make use of that technology for this reason. I, I've just got a funny image in my head of you uh, on a video conference with a patient and you say, show me your tongue. And I go, nah. <laughs> they actually <laughs> the do video. that. <laughs> really? And uh, you can even do things like... Um, if a child has abdominal pain, you can tell the parent what to do and where to press and get them to tell wow. you what they find. Or um, if we're backing up another healthcare provider like a, a nurse or a paramedic in a remote area, we can ask them to do certain manoeuvres to examine the patient and report to us or watch them do it, which is even better. That's, that is absolutely fascinating. It's sort of like a... You're almost there. You're virtually there to do a, a sort of a diagnosis. And wow, we really That's right. We really are living in the 21st century, folks. Now, when did your interest in, well, quackery in general start? But more recently, I know you've been um, very active uh, fighting the anti-vaxxers. That's right. Um, I first heard about the organisation called the AVN, which is a deceptively named but anti-vax mm. network based in New South Wales originally. When I used to be involved in medical regulation, I was um, a member of the medical regulation board for the medical profession and I heard that the Healthcare Complaints Commission in New South Wales 
had issued a warning against this organisation and I went looking for information about them and that's when I found my way to their Facebook page and Mm. also another discussion page that they had and from there I found my way to a parallel group called Stop the AVN and I found very like-minded, many like-minded friends there and I found that people who are sceptical in the correct sense of the word and who value rational evidence about things also tend to have a similar sense of humour and be like-minded in many different ways. So Mm. I found there's a real network of rational people who don't just get frustrated by misinformation but who take an active role in trying to either correct it or limit its spread. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's wonderful to see that like-minded people getting together, I think, to do some real, some real good. And of course, we just think recently over the last couple of weeks, the the Vaxxed bus has been doing a, That's a, right. a mini tour in uh, in Queensland and the Australian Skeptics put out a little uh, a little notice notice about that. But we, I guess we sit back, if that's the right term, we wait to see what their next move will be. True, but we also do our best to predict where their activity will be mm. so that we can circumvent it rather than wait for it to happen and react. And right. that's why many of us spend time watching and anticipating activities, which um, helps us to map out where the future direction might be. Because obviously it's like um, front page news that it's always better to prevent the mistakes being published than to issue a correction on page three. It has much less impact if it's already gone out. Is that sort of like a stitch in time? Saves nine. That's a very good clinical analogy there, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. So just recently, of course, with the, the whole world has is, is changed dramatically and I'm sure uh, people in your profession are acutely aware of what's going on with the COVID-19. You must be, I don't know, beyond appalled and gobsmacked and, and amazed at some of the, the craziness coming out now with people still insisting that the whole thing is a scam and a hoax and uh, it's not very serious. Yes, it's bizarre, isn't it? And I think one of the greatest ironies that I've noticed is that for years the anti-vax movement has tried to tell us that it wasn't vaccines that saved us from infectious diseases, it was public health measures like um, hygiene. And now that they're being asked to use public health measures and follow hygiene directives, they're rebelling against that. So all the more evidence that it was never about any kind of science. It was always about defying authority and not wanting to be told what to do. It's nothing about reality or the real science behind infectious disease because by the previous logic they should be championing the fact that we're controlling an infectious disease with hygiene and um, practical measures and not with pharmaceuticals. So it's also an irony that many of the same population are now on the hydroxychloroquine bandwagon. Right. What a bizarre turn that is, that the, the health truthers want to push a pharmaceutical. It's just um, the convolutions never end. You make some, some points that hadn't occurred to me, of course. We've got these people who have been protesting loudly that you know we should live a natural life and simple measures are the best and That's everything. Right. When they are presented with a very simple measure, wear a bloody face mask, they go to pieces. Isn't it bizarre? And obviously, as an experienced clinician, I also know that there are few, if any, contraindications to using a mask. All of this stuff about medical exemptions and having asthma is just back to front that it's only a few months ago that the asthmatics were wearing masks during the the bushfire smoke. Right. And the masks were protective of them. So how a mask would suddenly be dangerous for people with asthma makes no sense at all. And I, I know that 
in hospital practice, if somebody comes into emergency with a potentially infectious disease, they almost always wear a mask and they're there because they're sick. So again, the idea that the mask could be dangerous for anyone is just bizarre. It really is. I've been wearing a mask now um, out and about. Uh, and apart from my glasses fogging up, which is a bit annoying, I'm, I've yet to uh, have a serious uh, side effect. Funny that, isn't it? And in fact, people can do long, detailed neurosurgery for hours where they have to have strong concentration or cardiac. People transplanting hearts can wear surgical masks for hours and hours without fainting yeah. from breathing their CO2. <laughs> and so <laughs> suddenly these people who've never had that experience before are, are touting physiological problems that clearly don't exist as yeah. if they've got expertise. It's funny you should mention that. It, it, I've just been reminded of the time I played a doctor in a TV show once and uh, I was uh, doing uh, or helping with a heart transplant operation and I had to wear a face mask for hours while we did all the rehearsal there you and go. the takes. Yeah. So. <laughs> and clearly you survived. <laughs> Somehow I survived, even though I was I was just acting. Finally, please tell us about your activity and your involvement with the uh, the very worthwhile group, the Friends of Science in Medicine. Yes, it is a very worthwhile group. This is um, a group of people who include clinical medicine providers, but also is a really wide community who are not necessarily from the health world, but just believe in using science in the provision of healthcare. And interestingly, a lot of people have come on board with that idea during the pandemic because they realised that science and evidence is the only way of containing medical risk. So our group in the early days was very much concentrated on the teaching of pseudoscience in tertiary institutions. Right. And unfortunately, a little of that still exists, not in the mainstream, the major universities, but people can still obtain a science degree in non-science, which is such a paradox that you could learn theories of how the body works that are, are counter to the known directly observed evidence of how the body works. So that's something that Friends of Science in Medicine is constantly campaigning against at every opportunity. But of course, we've also had the opportunity to promote good policy like um, No Jab, No Pay. We appeared at the Senate inquiry on that policy. And we also take a wide view now beyond tertiary education into health misinformation and the promotion of evidence in healthcare wherever we can. Well, your uh, your job's cut out for you, and it's uh, that's for sure. There'll always be a, a need for friends of science and medicine and people like that because it's it's never ending. It's it's a river that keeps flowing, isn't it? It is, but. We can, we have seen tangible progress, both from Stop the AVN and from Sense of Friends of Science in Medicine, that probably the organised misinformation and anti-science groups have been going on longer than the attempts to correct them. And so we've played a bit of catch up, but in the relatively short time that the groups that I'm involved in have existed, We've made progress in influencing policy and also, importantly, in having the media understand about false balance and about which experts have credibility. Right. So what keeps us going very much is the sense that we have made progress. We're not just shouting in the wilderness, but we have the agency to have an influence on misinformation. Certainly a group you should know about. Well, Sue, wonderful to catch up with you. I hope we can catch up in person one day soon. Likewise, Richard. Who knows when that will be? I um, I mean, I know this is, they keep saying uncharted and unprecedented, which is true. But um, 
there's there's just no there's just no horizon really we can look at and to say there that's where we're going and after that horizon we we'll be on the other side it's it's a bit muddy it is a bit and one of the things to realize is that knowledge of the way forward has always been an adaptation and so when people get worried about policy being made as the evidence changes that's reality in science that we've always had to adapt to new observations and build upon knowledge so re- rather than being scared by that i think the audience should be happy that health policies being made according to evidence as it emerges i think that's a very good sentiment to leave the interview on so sue yurachi all the way over there in sydney <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks Richard. Hello, Richard Saunders here, life member of Australian Skeptics, and that's for life. I'm here to tell you about the Australian Skeptics annual Bent Spoon Award awarded each year at our convention Skepticon. This year is a first for the Ben Spoon Award and the convention. Yes, like everything else these days, it's online. But imagine you can enjoy this convention from the comfort of your own couch. Uh, some of the past winners, or maybe I should say losers of the Ben Spoon Award have been Racing car driver Peter Brock, the Lutec free energy generator, Mike Willisey, the ABC television program Second Opinion, the Chiropractors Association of Australia, the SBS television program Medicine or Myth. N- now, who I hear you cry is in the running this year for the Ben Spoon Award, awarded to the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle. Try saying that after a few drinks. In the running this year for the award that no one wants to win are Pete Evans and the Biocharger, Meryl Dory, Fran Sheffield and Homeopathy Plus, Judy Wileyman, MMS Australia Genesis 2 Church Chapter 316, Kyle and Jackie O. But there is still time to nominate more people or institutions for this award. And who's going to win? How should I know? I'm not psychic. Find out. Join us at Skepticon 2020. Skepticon 2020. Hosted by the Gold Coast Skeptics. For more information and booking, visit www.skepticon.org.au. Logical Fallacies What are logical fallacies and why is it important that critical thinkers should know about them? A logical fallacy is an error we can make in reasoning, but it usually crops up when we are discussing or arguing our point of view. Some people might even knowingly use them to try and score cheap points in an argument due to intellectual laziness. They are traps we can fall into, but if we know what to look out for, we can spot them when they occur and stop ourselves from using them. This time, we'll look at the appeal to consequences. This is when it's concluded that an idea or proposition is true or false, because the consequences of it being true or false are desirable or undesirable to the one making the claim. We are all guilty of using this fallacy from time to time. It's normal to embellish ideas or beliefs we like and to denigrate ideas and beliefs we don't. In this case, it's using the expected or possible outcomes, whether they happen or not, 
to bolster our point of view. This fallacy comes in two forms, positive and negative. Skeptics complain about alternative medicine and things like ear candles being sold in my pharmacy. But I can tell you, many people say they really work and come here to buy them. Also, my profits depend on it. Here we have an example of the positive form. The pharmacist is using the perceived positive outcomes or consequences to his customers and the real financial outcome to his business to justify the products on sale. In the case of something like ear candles, where you stick a tube of wax in your ear canal and light the other end, yes, this really is a thing, glowing testimonials and good sales have no bearing on the fact that these things are dangerous nonsense. GMOs are evil and must be stopped now. Who knows what awful things will happen to people eating genetically modified foods? They might end up glowing in the dark or or worse? Here we have an example of the negative form. It is being argued that GMOs are bad because of the negative consequences on humans. However, as no one has been able to read a book in the dark owing to glowing skin, or indeed had any reported negative consequences at all from eating GMOs, the original premise of the argument does not hold up. You see what happens when we stop accepting creationism and turn to the theory of evolution? Immoral conduct, as society turns to survival of the fittest. Caring and compassion are left behind. Again, the logical fallacy in its negative form. It might come as a shock to creationists, but caring and compassion, just like every other emotion, comes about in our species via the process of evolution. Scaremongering about feared negative outcomes of accepting evolution does not strengthen the case for creationism one little bit. It's so easy to let ourselves think about the consequences or outcomes of ideas, beliefs or practices. And, as we've seen, it's also easy to use these perceived outcomes to colour our reasoning or to give us faulty ammunition when arguing our point of view. Knowing a logical fallacy when you hear one, and even knowing its name, is important when arguing your point of view. However, you may come across as arrogant and not get very far if you call it out by name to your opponent when you hear it being used. If your opponent calls you out for using one, it's time to stop and think about how you are making your case. Use your knowledge of logical fallacies wisely and remember that even if your point of view is right and you know all the pitfalls in arguing your case, it doesn't always mean you'll win on the day. And as skeptics, we must also remember that we too can be wrong at times. I'm Michelle Bickersma from the Vic Skeptics. Thanks for listening. How's the patient doing in room 1965? Ah, Dr. Oh, Dr. Celestia Ward. Hello, good to see you. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Brian Dunning. Yes, okay. Hmm. Looks like he's not responding to the current course of medication. He's not been able to get out of bed for a week now. I thought as much. I mean, he should really not be that shade of green. And those blue spots on his toes, not good at all. Well, we have him on penicillin, but I think I'm going to prescribe some new medicine we just got in. It's called Ciparadix. 30C. Oh, I have not heard of that. Is, is it Latin? Yeah, sounds like it. I'm not sure what it means. And what's 30C? Is that, is that the temperature it should be stored or, or something? Oh, good question. I'll have to ask our new drug supplier. 
the uh, Samuel Hanneman Homeopathic Remedy Company of Walla Walla, Washington. Home- homeopathic? Homeopathic? Why, why are we using a homeopathic product? They're cheap. They quoted us the lowest price, and you know we're under pressure to uh, economize. And what's even better, a representative told me we can use the same bottle of pills for every condition. So, heart palpitations, use Sepa Radix 30C. Blood clots, we can use Sepa Radix 30C. Headaches, we can, wait for it, we can use Sepa Radix 30C. It's going to save us a fortune and we don't have to worry about giving patients the wrong medication. (sighs) Okay, I I, I better get back to my paperwork. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. I'll start my rounds. It's okay, I've got lots of those pills. To the Chief Executive, Lakeside Hospital. Dear Chief, I am writing to you about concerns... I have had for some time about my colleague, Dr. Richard Saunders, who is on a transfer posting to this hospital from Australia. Apart from his habit of eating Vegemite toast during consultations and offering patients something called musk sticks, which he claims will cheer them up. In fact, it seems to make them ill. It is his choice of medication that is of a more immediate concern. I know we are all expected to cut corners to save money, but I must question the wisdom of Dr. Saunders in getting so-called medication from a homeopathic supplier. I can only hope we are paying this company in homeopathic dollars. Yours, etc., etc. P.S. Next time we have a transfer... Let's try Dr. Radford. He's a bit of a square and very strange, but these days we cannot be too picky. Get that away from me! Help! Help! Get that away! What, what was that? Look, I, uh, I, I just checked with Mr. Dunning, and you'll be pleased to know he's suddenly very active. Well, that, that's good news. Did, did you give him more homeopathic medicine? No. I gave him a mustic and he ran screaming out of the room. He's cured. <sighs> Sovereign citizens, free men of the land. These are terms we are hearing more and more these days here in Australia. Normally, this is the sort of thing we'd hear about from the United States. News programs possibly are in the habit of having a wacky, crazy, zany story at the end of the bulletin or the end of the week. Now to wrap off, we have only in America. Well, now we have this sort of thing happening here in Australia. Well, more and more. It's probably been uh, happening for a while. And appearing from news.com.au is a story by Rowan Smith. Coronavirus Victoria. Sovereign citizens. Tactic infuriating cops. Some Victorians think they are beyond the law, calling themselves, quote, sovereign citizens, with a move that's infuriating police. Victoria's Chief Police Commissioner, Shane Patton, has revealed that some Victorians think they are beyond the law and are calling themselves sovereign citizens. In the last week, we've seen a trend, an emergence, if you like, of groups of people, small groups, but nonetheless concerning groups, who classify themselves as sovereign citizen, whatever that might mean, people 
who don't think the law applies to them. We've seen them at checkpoints, baiting police, not providing a name and address. On at least four occasions in the last week, we've had to smash the windows of cars and pull people out to provide details because they weren't adhering to the chief health officer's coronavirus guidelines. They weren't providing their name and address. We don't want to be doing that, but people have to absolutely understand there are consequences for your actions, and if you're not doing the right thing, we will not hesitate to issue infringements, to arrest you, to detain you where it's appropriate. Eve Black became the face of the sovereign citizen movement when she filmed herself refusing to give police details at a checkpoint. Thanks. I think you can hear me today. You can hear me fine. Yeah, that's fine. fine. Um, reason for travelling. Ah, oh, have I disturbed the peace today? Hey. Have I disturbed the peace? No. No. I'm just asking what your reason for travelling is. Well, I don't need to tell you that. I don't know you. Okay. So where have you come from today? I don't need to answer your questions. No. no. Have I committed a crime? Pardon? Have I committed a crime? Have I committed a crime? Thank you. She was later arrested and charged, but police had to break her window to get access to her. Daniel Andrews, and he's the uh, current Premier of the state of Victoria, has flagged potential tightening of mandatory mask rules after reports young people were telling frontline officers they can't wear one due to medical reasons. Currently, there are no requirements to provide proof. The Victorian Premier says if we need to tie that up, of course we will. I'll just take a deep breath. Is there anything worse than someone pretending to be unwell in order to get out of wearing a mask? He said. Like, seriously, you need to wear a mask. You will be pulled up. If I've got to change the rules again, if I've got to go further, then of course we will. We're not going to have police being lied to. We're not going to have people just flouting these rules. Mr Andrews said if it's not too much to ask an intensive care nurse to wear a mask, it's not too much to ask you to wear a mask in order to avoid that nurse having to treat more patients than they otherwise would. The notion of lying about your health status to avoid wearing a mask and, in fact, putting other people's health at risk, that's shameful. Shameful. He said, I'll have a conversation with the Chief Commissioner about that, and if a further change needs to be made, of course we will. Victoria has reported 11 deaths and 439 new cases today, and that was on the uh, the 4th of August, with Premier Daniel Andrews announcing tough new $5,000 on-the-spot fines for, quote, selfish, end quote, isolation breaches. It comes after the state ordered a widespread retail shutdown on Monday that is expected to lead to a further 250,000 job losses. And that story comes to us from news.com.au, written by Rowan Smith. And a link will appear in this week's show notes. Also, we can look over at The Conversation, theconversation theconversation.com, to a story written by Kaz Ross. Living people who are the sovereign citizens, or sovsits, and why do they believe they have immunity from the law? And this was published on July the 28th. You might have seen articles or comments on social media lately alluding to sovereign citizens, or sovsits, for short, with some reports suggesting COVID-19 government Restrictions have driven a surge of interest in this movement. So, who are these self-styled sovereign citizens and what do they believe? Sovereign citizens are concerned with the legal framework of society. They believe all people are born free with rights, but these natural rights are being constrained by corporations and they see governments as artificial corporations. They believe citizens are in an oppressive contract with the government. Sovsits 
reportedly believe that by declaring themselves, quote, living people, or, quote, natural people, they can break this oppressive contract and avoid restrictions such as certain rates, taxes, and fines, or particular government rules on mandatory mask wearing. The Sovsit movement arose in America decades ago, with roots in the American Patriot Movement, some religious communities, and tax protest groups. It has also been known as the, quote, free man, end quote, movement reinterpreting the law. Sovsits see themselves as sovereign and not bound by the laws of the country in which they physically live. Accepting a law or regulations means they have waived their rights as a sovereign and have accepted the contract with the government, according to Sovsit belief. The Sovsit movement doesn't have a single leader central doctrine, or centralized collection of documents. It is based on their reinterpretation of the law, and there are many legal document templates on the internet for Sovsit to use. For example, avoid paying fines or rates they see as unfair. Sovsits tend not to follow conventional legal argument. Some have engaged in repeated court action or even been declared vexatious litigants by the courts. The Sovsit movement has many local variations, but there are some key commonalities across the Australian Sovsit movement. Key beliefs and phrases. A central belief, according to news reports, is that the Australian government, the police and other government agencies are corporations. Believers feel they must be on guard to avoid entering into a contract with the corporation. They often do this by stating, quote, I do not consent, end quote, and trying to get the police officer or official to recognize them as a, quote, living, end quote, or, quote, natural, end quote, being, and therefore, as a sovereign. Sovsits are often careful to avoid showing ID, such as driver's license or giving their name and address, saying, quote, I understand, end quote, also risks being seen to agree to the contract. So Sovsits will repeat the phrase, quote, I comprehend, end quote, to show they are refusing the contract. Many reject their country's constitution as false, and reportedly refer to the Magna Carta of 1215 as the only true legal document constraining arbitrary power. Sovsits often come to the attention of authorities due to driving offences. It is a core belief of the movement that, quote, sovereigns, end quote, have the right to travel freely without the need for a driver's license, vehicle registration, or insurance. Until COVID-19, the main threat seems to have been in committing road offences. More recently, actions protesting measures aimed at limiting the spread of COVID-19 have been linked to the sovereign citizen movement. And that story can be found over at The Conversation, theconversation.com, written by Kaz Ross, lecturer in Humanities, Asian Studies, University of Tasmania. Now, the blog posting over at Skeptoid, the Skeptoid blog, the legal gibberish of free men on the land. Uh, it was written by Mike Rothschild and published in October 2013. It's certainly worth a read, and it says in part, You're driving down the street, going as fast as you please, and ignoring traffic laws you didn't consent to. After running a red light enforcing said laws, which don't apply to you, you see the blue flashing lights of a police cruiser. While you are in your common law rights to demand any sum of money to pull you over, you decide to make it easy on the government enforcer and stop. When the police officer approaches your car, you immediately ask, Under what authority and under what law are you acting? The government enforcer can't quote the common law statute that authorizes him to act. Why would he? He's only an agent of the state. 
only demand to see your license, registration and proof of insurance. However, these statutory obligations don't apply to you, and you refuse. The officer asks what your name is, to which you reply, Are you seeking a publicly registered legal personality created by the state? The officer, predictably, orders you out of the car at gunpoint, arrests you and reads you your rights. When asked if you understand these rights, you reply, I do not understand under that statement, nor do I understand under any statement. Then you're led into the police car. What am I talking about? What does all this gibberish mean? It's just a sample of the standard tactics used by the free man on the land movement, also known as FOLT. It's a version of the sovereign citizen movement that's rapidly catching on with snowflakes in Canada and England and causing an increasing amount of chaos with courts and judges who don't know how to combat its nuance and the belligerent arrogance of those who apply it. To detractors, it's a jargon-laden way to pretend the laws of your country don't apply to you. But to its advocates, it's nothing less than grabbing freedom back from an illegal government that took it away from you at birth. And I will leave that there, just whetting your appetite, and you can certainly go to the Skeptoid blog and read the rest of that for yourself. But I find it increasingly interesting, slash increasingly infuriating and exasperating to see these people in a time of international crisis hitting home hard, especially for those people in the state of Victoria and the city of Melbourne, who continue to act upon these crazy conspiracy theories, really, and uh, asserting rights they don't have, and basically really giving up their responsibility to the wider community. Ultimately, I think it's an incredibly selfish thing to do, to stamp your foot and demand your rights at the expense uh, of your fellow citizens, especially if they end up in the hospital or dead. And uh, I think I mentioned on last week's episode, for a long time, these sort of people were tolerated as funny, uh, a bit extreme, sometimes a pain, but uh, more or less not too serious. Conspiracy theories in general, really. Um, We denigrate them, the tinfoil hat brigade, and on and on it goes. But at this time, we can see uh, they actually do not only cause a, a nuisance for uh, police, who at the moment, that's the last thing they need, but seriously are a danger to the general community. So we'll be keeping an eye on these uh, free men on the land, these sovereign citizens over the next months here in Australia. And I think there might be an article or a feature coming up in the next issue of The Skeptic, the journal from Australian skeptics about this very topic. And it's a good opportunity to uh, remind you that if you feel like you can contribute to the skeptical movement here in Australia, why not contact the Australian skeptics, Tim Mendham, the executive officer and editor of that fine journal, The Skeptic, and maybe you too can have something published. Hi, my name's Joe Thornley, and I'd like you to join my co- um, I'd like you to listen to my podcast about cults called Zealot. It's available pretty much anywhere you find podcasts with further reading on the Zealot Facebook page. Each episode, a guest joins me to talk about a specific cult where we answer the big questions like, is there yoga in it? And does anyone think they're Jesus? Pop over to my compound and have a listen. I've just mixed up a fresh batch of Kool-Aid. Oh, sell it. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. Now, coming up, coming up, 
next week on Sunday the 16th of August, and that's just after the next episode of The Skeptic Zone goes online, Sunday the 16th of August, 10 a.m., 10 a.m. here in Sydney, Sydney time, or, or as it's known, Australian Eastern Standard Time, I will be hosting an online um, chat, video chat, uh, on behalf of the Canberra Skeptics. In fact, this is an event being hosted by the Canberra Skeptics, and it's going to be a panel discussion. And on that panel, Susan Gerbeck from Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia and a regular contributor to the Skeptic Zone, Dr. Steve Novella, from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and our very own Jessica Singer, who is the president of Australian Skeptics, Inc. And this will be about successes and failures of science, skepticism, and critical thinking. And if you'd like to take part in that, view, have a look, join in, and then all the rest of it, just head for canberraskeptics.org. Certainly there will be a link in this week's show notes, but it's very easy to find. If you Google Canberra Skeptics or head to canberraskeptics.org, you can find that information for yourself. And I hope that you will join us uh, on the 16th here in Australia, which will be the 15th in North America. And just check your local time zones wherever you are around the world. In other exciting news, I had my second day or half day, a <laughs> half day of paid work in the uh, TV and film profession just last week. And when I say my second day, I mean for 2020. Wow, how about that? Every little bit helps. And uh, every little bit helps when it comes to contributions from Skeptic Zone listeners just like you. And in fact, you can thank, well, if you enjoy the show, I hope you enjoy the show, you can thank all the people who do contribute via PayPal or Patreon for the fact that you are listening to the show right now. So thank you, people. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, all those people who contribute. Coming up on next week's show, I think more logical fallacies with the fabulous Michelle Bickersma. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off once again, for, as if I can go really anywhere else, from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Hello to the afterthoughts, the people who listen after the music... And for those people who don't know why the hell I'm speaking after the music, because you're listening to the show for the first time, hello, hello. I have a D10, a D10, 10-sided die. There it is. And I'm going to roll it three times, and it's uh, your task, should you decide to accept it, to guess what numbers are going to come up. Now, where's my skeptic zone pad? Oh, here it is, okay. Oops, hitting the microphone. I always like to write these numbers down, get them right. So, here we go. I'm going to roll the die. Use your predicting magic powers or dumb luck. Probably dumb luck. Roll one. Today's first number on the Skeptic Zone dice is... Die? Ten. Ten. I know Susan Gerbeck always hopes for number five. Susan, I'll see what I can do. Well, I can roll the dice. We'll see what happens. Oh, it's a three. How are you going there at home? Let's see. Or if you're in the car, kids, kids in the back seat, what's the next number going to be? Come on. What? Who said four? Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh, Susan, Susan, Susan. It's five. There you go. 
how about that? I keep saying I should video this because people say I'm making it up to um for gags or to make it funny. No, no, it's exactly the numbers that come out. Today's winning numbers. 10, 3, and 5.